Hi, my name is Mandy Horton. I'm a professor at the University of Central Oklahoma where I teach history of graphic design courses. I'm here with my friends James and Brock and we're going to talk to you today a little bit about the history of zines, self-publishing, and in conjunction with the Ed Ruscha exhibit here at Oklahoma Contemporary. James? Hi, my name is James Ewald and I am a assistant professor at Oklahoma State University teaching graphic design. And I'm Brock Wynn. I'm also a professor of graphic design at the University of Central Oklahoma. Uh, James and I um, run and operate a small specialty print shop um, called the Cauldron Press in Oklahoma City. Uh, we specialize in using a Rezo duplicator to produce our work. In addition to designing, printing, and producing our own work, we also exhibit locally, nationally, and internationally. So why don't we talk a little bit about the history of zines and um, maybe uh, what is a zine exactly? How would you describe a zine, Brock? I would think of a zine more as a, almost more as a format in a way, because when you start getting into content, that's where it kind of gets a little bit fuzzy. Okay. But zines are really low, uh, lo-fi, um, economical, um, not necessarily considered high art, but they're really a way to spread a message um, and you know maybe a message that isn't widely acceptable or part of subculture. Um, usually zines were um, saddle stitched, you know, a letter sized sheet of paper folded in half nested inside of each other. There are a lot of different ways to do it, but it's I think it's the the perceived low quality and and low budgetness of it that kind of categorizes something as a zine. One of the reasons that, again, that we're here is to talk about this work in conjunction with or zines and self-publishing in conjunction with Ed Ruscha, who published his own art books in the 60s and 70s. Um, uh, some examples that are here on display include 26 gasoline stations, um, every building on Sunset Strip. So I wanted to get your take on the differences in zines and that avenue of self-publishing and maybe art books. Um, which is what Ed Ruscha's work is, is classified as or can categorize, categorized as. When I think of an art book, I think of it being the book itself is the art. So the way it's put together, the materials it uses, the way it's bound, everything is part of that. For a zine, the paper didn't matter. It's whatever paper you had sometimes. So it was more about the content than it was the format. But for an art book or an artist book, what, however way you want to um, say it, it's really about the physicality, tangible, you know, the tangible qualities of that thing. Interactivity. Uh, interactivity. Yeah. Um, and it's not like a normal book you'd find on a bookshelf or at the library. It's something special. It can either be a limited run or it could be a one-off. And Ruscha, I think uh, his limited run was like around a thousand. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, obviously it becomes a lot more precious. Yeah. Um, size. It was really kind of interesting, uh, you know, especially with uh, Ruscha's sizes. Um, they're a little more intimate, but then they can expand into something like way bigger, which is really kind of amazing mm -hmm. uh, to really take a look at that. So, um, you know, as like a person uh, viewing this, you know, you can view it page by page, like a normal kind of book, but then again, that expansion, so it's like, uh, space and now you're looking at it in a different almost like time frame where it's you know a snapshot in time and I'm thinking about what it was like uh, the Sunset Strip yeah every yeah. building on a Sunset Strip yeah which is absolutely you know kind of amazing but then you get to see kind of the quirkiness of it yeah which yeah, is really yeah. kind of interesting yeah the way the images are stitched together yes yeah. and so you can see sometimes where the stitching is uh -huh. which is really kind of interesting I mean, Mandy and I, we, we, we were looking at it and um, it's like, it's the same 
building, but at different times, because the shadows are different, so we're seeing this contrast between light and dark. Right. Um, One building in particular, it, you could tell that it was maybe later that day yeah. or another day, and um, there were motorcycles in front of part of it, and then in another section where the, that stitching was happening, there's a, a like a VW bug yeah. or something. I think that a lot of people, when they think of art books, they think of these you know, really high production books like Tashin. Um, and then of course, a lot of gatekeeping comes into that and comes into play with that. And certainly Ed Ruscha has books um, from Tashin and, and some of these really well-known publishers, but the books that he was making in the 1960s and 1970s because of the production value and, um, you know, he was printing them himself and he would charge two or three dollars uh, for each edition. Um, and then, you know, if he ran out, he would sometimes just print them up again. Um, that sort of, that production quality kind of reminds me a little bit of zines and uh, that self-publishing entity. Yeah, I mean, the, the idea of like small runs, limited runs, that's very, uh, 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 I guess, integrated into the art book zine culture. Um, it's also, this idea of you know price point making it affordable uh, to your audience. What's interesting is Rouchet's books, even though they might have that zine quality, still I think fall into the art book category because of the content. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was it was well designed, so you know you can really kind of tell that there is a visual narrative that's being you know produced throughout the book. Um, and, you know, even though there isn't any body copy that's really kind of attached to it, you can still see the humor right. through the imagery right. that Boucher is, you know, uh, has selected for us. So he leads us through this visual narrative and sometimes you can see the satirical nature. Right. I was all. really thinking about that with the um, Small Fires and Milk book. Um, I, I felt like it was kind of had this sense of humor, yeah. like almost irreverent quality that actually, in terms of content and, and humor, kind of reminded me more of zines than necessarily an art book. Yeah, I mean, there was, there was this kind of, um, kind of uh, just joking manner about how he saw these fires. Normally we would think like, okay, like a fire. <laughs> but. You know, it was like a woman smoking a cigarette. There was um, a flare on the side of a road. Those kinds of things, those are those aha moments where you're like, I wish I would have thought of that. This is such a great <laughs> idea. You know? um, even people who are mainstream use that self-publishing as kind of a way to, I mean, express themselves in a more unique way that may not be as palatable to everyone, so it's kind of like your alter ego. Um, so you use that as a method to just, you know, disconnect your self-published work, your more experimental stuff from the identity that you have as a professional and what people associate you with. That makes a lot of sense. So it's kind of good for everybody in some ways. So zines, where, do you, is there like a moment in history that you guys can think of that where zines come about? I really think about zines um, and like the punk culture of like what was that, like the late 70s, mid to late 70s? Um, is that where, where you think, where, if you're familiar with that history that came about? I, I think that's where, you know, contemporary zine culture has kind of really picked up. Yeah. And that is during the late 70s, early 80s, with the arrival of like punk, but also technology that was readily available okay. at the time. Um, again, you know, if you were to think about economically, you know, how would you be able to mass produce certain things like show flyers, like zines? How do you do it? You know, the advent of like, the risograph printer, the copier. Those were things that really kind of helped uh, 
with the idea of production. So um, you get this subculture that is grasping at like how do we how do we make things for ourselves without going to a printer because we all know that printers are extremely expensive. So you know how do we do that and then also how do you uh, disseminate this kind of information. Um, so on a, on a weekly or daily basis. So um, <clears throat> The photocopier was probably the, the main thing that really helped a lot of zines um, start to come into existence because um, I think Punk Magazine um, started off um, utilizing uh, a photocopier and I think they also used like a toy uh, typewriter the creator had, you know, got for Christmas when they were a kid and they used that and they hand drew everything. Even some zines, all of the I guess wouldn't be technically type, but all the hand lettering was done by hand, mm -hmm. every single bit of it. So they used whatever they could, and the Xerox copier, or not Xerox, but the photocopier was the one thing that kind of helped them mass produce those. Um, and I think a lot of things were limited in color, but then they would use different colored paper. I think a lot of show flyers and gig posters kind of originated from that as well. And there was that sort of DIY um, movement that was going on because the people that were often producing these flyers and zines, right, they, they didn't really have a history of printing, they didn't really have a background in design, so they were really sort of figuring all of that stuff out as they went along, right? Yeah, I mean, even if you look at the underground press and some of the publications like the Oracle and things like that, um, those papers in the 60s, a lot of them really didn't have formal design training. So a lot of their layouts were more experimental. Uh, and the process of designing and laying out and actually producing them was cost effective. So it allowed people who didn't have the training to actually get into the game a little bit more. Yeah, I think I remember something about like the East Village Other, mm -hmm. uh, an underground newspaper, changed their format several times right when they were first starting out because they were figuring out the best format for printing and it ended up like they they did like tabloid size but that was too big and I think they even did like an accordion fold for an early version but then ultimately they went to something that was very standard um, size format because they figured out that it was just much more cost effective for production. Mm -hmm. And they were also consuming drugs at the same time. <laughs> of course. So maybe that's why some of the designs look the way they do. <laughs> right, right, of course. Let's talk a little bit more about the technology behind zine making. Um, maybe I, you've mentioned a little bit about um, photocopying. Um, how did that drive making zines? Um, and then uh, risographs, that sort of thing, and, and any other technology maybe. I mean, any technology that allowed you know, just a normal person to produce um, really helped push that along. Like the mimeograph was something that people had in schools. I think a lot of people, if you're an old timer, you know, <laughs> um, probably remember those machines in their high schools. Um, things like, uh, they're kind of workhorse machines, essentially. Um, and they're easy for people to use. They're economical. Um, so anything that gives more access to this printing process starts to drive the self-publication because now you have an opportunity to produce your own work um, and you could probably afford to do it. Um, so I guess it would start with the mimeograph and then eventually the photocopier kind of took over the role of that just because I think it was a little bit easier to use. And then um, the risograph came in I get, I'm not really sure. I think they're, they're actually started developing them in the 40s, the process for it. And then it was also a ubiquitous uh, printing uh, a press or printer that a lot of schools have. And what's the difference between a risograph and a photocopier? Um, in layman's terms. <laughs> a riso... <laughs> well, how do I explain this one? Um, 
essentially, uh, I'm not really sure how to explain that. Why would you I'm not choose sure if I a know how of... <laughs> over a photocopier? Um, probably for the ink, um, because it's a more tangible ink. You know, it has a texture to it. It has a certain feel and quality to it that a Xerox doesn't have. I keep saying Xerox, but uh, it's like saying Kleenex, right. you know. Um, I think for us, it's just a, I like the process of printing because you print with one color at a time. If you're fortunate, you have multiple colors at a time, but we don't have that kind of machinery. <laughs> um, but it is, it produces a stencil and then it, that stencil wraps around a drum okay. and then the ink is pushed through the stencil. So wherever there are openings, which is the actual image, it presses onto the paper. It's just like a uh, serigraphy. Okay. It's pretty much the same idea, but with a Rizzo, you can print thousands of copies in a few minutes. Okay. If you were inclined to do that. If you were inclined to do that, yeah. So, um, and you all produce books at the Cauldron Press using Rizographs. Do you use photocopiers too, or just the Rizzo? We use just a Rizzo. We also use a, a laser printer, but okay. it's part of our process to print okay. on the Rizzo. Um, I think we enjoy that process a lot, so we just kind of stick with the Rizzo. Um, Self-publishing, you can do anything that makes a mark on paper or an impression people use. Um, but that's pretty much all we use in our studio. That's, that's why we created it. Okay. You know, we bought a printer, we needed a place to put it, and that became our studio, essentially. And Rezographs are kind of seeing this like revolution right now, right? Where like a few years ago it was happening with the letterpress where they almost died out. People were getting rid of them, you couldn't sell them, you couldn't give them away, and then all of a sudden uh, it became really, really popular because people got really interested in, in crafting by hand again, and so people started gathering up those used, you know, discarded letter presses. And, and I feel like, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like that has kind of recently happened again with the Rizograph. Is that true? Um, about the last 10 or 15 years um, in this part of the country, no, it's very recent. <laughs> okay. But if you look in other countries and, you know, Europe, Europe and, and Asia, Asia okay. they've been using them for quite a while. Uh, again, the printers didn't really die off. They were just used for something else. They're okay. used in schools and government buildings and office churches. It's an office, you know, it's office equipment. So for it to be used now uh, for creative purposes is relatively new. And so people are finding new ways of using it and pushing it a little bit further. New colors. They've continued to develop yeah. colors. They keep developing the technology to make the colors more archival. They're coming out with new machines periodically, so they're still alive and well. Okay, wow. Yeah, that's that's pretty cool. Well, I think that's, that's about it. Um, did you all have anything you wanted to add about zines or self-publishing? It's a fun process, and <laughs> it's it's very it's. I say that you know because you were able to be um, you know ourselves, and I believe being from this part of the country mm -hmm. that it really allows us to have a voice as Oklahomans. Mm -hmm. And we're able to disseminate, you know, that Oklahoma, you know, isn't just a flyover state, but it's our views, it's our, you know, feelings, it's our art. And people are really surprised when they see the work that we're exhibiting, mm -hmm. um, that we normally probably wouldn't get that chance to because of, you know, issues like gatekeeping from like larger uh, publishing houses, we have our voice and, you know, this is why we love, you know, being able to self-publish and allowing others, including students, to kind of have that same voice and to disseminate and use our network. So I think uh, self-publishing really has kind of um, given uh, us and you know like the community kind of um, a new avenue of uh, 
exploration when it comes to ideas and making. Okay. Anything to add, Brock? No, everything he said. Uh, it's kind of like I get to go in and make what I want to make. It's not client-driven work. So as a graphic designer, you find that you're doing a lot of work for someone else. Yeah. So you're having to detach your own personal opinions and design for an audience that, you know, is not you yeah. <laughs> or people like you. And this is a really good way to just kind of let it all out at the end of the day. And it's also a pretty, you know, self-publishing could be a very lucrative um, direction for designers to take as well to kind of prolong their career. Okay. Because at some point you might get burned out. Um, I've known some people who've been in big agencies and done, you've know, gone through the grind and now they're like, I kind of want to do my own thing now for a while. And right. I think it's liberating okay. to do that. Um, I think that kind of sort of seems to come back around to this, to... Um, art and design um, because it seems, well, for a lot of people I know that, that design is for a client and art is for yourself. And so it almost seems like zine making, even though it's, it's categorized as maybe graphic design, is almost, if you're self-publishing anyway, it's, it's for yourself and it almost becomes your own personal art. Yeah, I mean, art is probably a truer form of self-expression. Mm -hmm. Um, it's also way more subjective. Graphic design can't always be super subjective. Um, so I think there's really blurred lines when it comes to self-publishing, what is art and what is design. When I first started out, I had a strong idea of which one was, <laughs> which one it was, because yeah. I have a painting degree you know, in fine arts, and now I have a graphic design degree as well. So my opinions have changed over time, and now I almost kind of see them equal. Right. And that I want to see people who put themselves in their work a little bit more, because it makes it more human, and it makes it easier for other people to, you know, get something from it as well. I agree with you. Relatable, yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>